I've been increasingly spending a lot of my energy and focus on the requirements side of Agile. Right? And uh, to be quite honest, the reason I've ended up there is that uh, there's not an awful lot of help in the field on how to approach requirements. Right? Steve was saying in his talk about the social side of Agile that you know, people don't tell us how to do this. Right? And, and one of the things, I think, uh, if I'm really honest, one of the things that really upsets me about some of the bigger conferences and you know, the books that come out, the articles you find on the internet, is there's a lot of waffle and hand-waving about concepts. You know, it would be really great if we had better conversations. You have to have better conversations, right? And, and various flavors of the discussions around that. And some of the you know, fancy ideas people have about teamwork. And then no one says, well, OK, how do you do that? You, know, you, need, to, you need to engage the interest of the business. And uh, what does that mean? There was a question here about how do I justify a technical uh, change to the business? And we say, well, you have to make it visible to them why there's business value. But what is business value? You know, how do I explain that? Right? Don't get a lot of people telling us that. So this talk is hopefully not going to have a lot of waffle and hand waving. There's some concepts, but what I'm going to do is try and illustrate the concepts with some things I actually have done to make those things work. And I think if we have more conference presentations or books and articles like that, that's what's going to make us a, uh, a better space for Agile. Right? So I, I was going to try something different here. Usually what I do is present straight off my slide deck and use my slide deck as prompted. And uh, I thought I'd try the cue card thing. I've done it before. But don't generally like it, but there's a lot of things I wanted to make sure you said. Uh, so the neat thing about being agile is, while Steve's talking, I could capture some thoughts. And there's actually some interesting links between what he said and what, what I've got to say. Right? And, um, you know, so you'll, you'll hopefully see how some of the things Steve is talking about are some of the things that I can help you with around you know, the conversations and interactions around requirements, right? Uh, and since he's run the battery out on his second uh, thing, as you go up and down here a bit, Susan's going to help me with the, the, the little piece here. All right, I like sports, right? And uh, this is a <coughs> picture that really sums up for me what's happening around the guidance on agile requirements at the moment, right? Who knows what this is? Anyone recognize where, what it is and where it is? It's steeplechase. This is Beaches Brook on Aintree Racecourse in Britain. It is the most deadly fence in steeplechase, right? The, the Aintree Racecourse is where they have the Grand National in England every year. There's dozens of horses go around. Every time they go around, they're going over this huge fence with a huge ditch, and horses are falling everywhere falling down everywhere. It's a huge leap. It's a huge leap. And uh, get rid of it. so this is how I feel about <coughs> what we're told to do with agile and requirements. I need you now. Right? I was gonna say I'll so, just stay up here and yeah. click while you talk. The, the visual doesn't the visual doesn't work. Okay. So how many of you read Ken Schwaber's scrum book, the little thin book, right? Or read the scum, scrum guide from Scrum Alliance, things like that, or the XP book, right? Now let's think about what it tells you about requirements. It says, yeah, we don't have anything right now. Make sure you can, yeah, you can all see that. Yeah, here I am, I don't have any right now. I'm at this base. Go find someone. Who knows what the requirements are? Go get a customer, put them on site. Go get a product owner. Great! Oh, I hurt. All right? So far. Make sure you focus on the business. Oh, it's pretty hard, right? 
Get them to tell you what they want. <laughs> Can't reach that far, <laughs> right? And it's like, ah, how do we do it? There's got to be steps. And this is what got me thinking about the whole theme here, and the word choreography came in. It's like, if I've got the steps, and I can move neatly from place to place, you know, we can, I can even get from here to there. It's a definitely steps, right? And we need to know what those steps are. And we need to, oh, no, yeah, go, go back. Well, no, I can stay here. OK, well, I'll leave it there for a second. That's good. I mean, linking to, I'm linking to that, right? So. Um, how we do that is the choreography of the Agile requirement. In fact, it's the choreography of the whole of Agile. And the problem is with the guidance we have, these huge leaps are not easy to make without making mistakes. They're not easy to make without hurting yourself. And people get frustrated and confused and there's lots of rework and things like that. Right? It's not smooth. Right? In my personal life, we're black belt in judo. Right? Any of you here, judoka, we call ourselves, or have experienced judo as well as martial arts? Some of you may have done other martial arts, taekwondo, karate, things like that. Right? One of the hardest techniques in judo is a throwing technique. In you know, UFC, you think of the takedown technique. It's called uchimata. Right? And basically, if you wanted to sum it up at the highest level, you could be told, grab your opponent, turn your back on them, kick your leg in the air, and throw them to the ground. <laughs> With those instructions, they never work. Because <laughs> what you have to do is, you have to grab your opponent, but you pull on their sleeve to get them up on their right foot. Pull on their collar to get them on their left toe. Go underneath, bring them from really deep between their legs so they can't get away. Then you turn your back and you sweep your leg up, and at the same time you lean down and pull your hands through, and they go whoosh, boom. It's one of the most powerful techniques. Done properly, you hit the ground with the same force as if you got hit by a truck. Right. The steps and the sequences that make that work is what makes that technique for us powerful. And without those steps and sequences, I'll tell you what happens. Your opponent looks at you and goes, boom, and you get thrown on your back with the force with two touch on Right? So it's no good. So what are the steps for Agile requirements. Yeah. What's the choreography that makes sure you don't get thrown on your back? Well, think Jackie Chan in his movies, right? You know, own a fight scene. What are the steps that make sure you don't screw up and get punched in the face by accident? Right? That's what I want to talk about. Right? That's what I want to talk about. And is that right? I've got to find that after the Okay, so when I was working in this space, particularly a lot of work with product owners and teams, right, I realized there were some very important principles in how you approach the interaction. Right? And it's about clear thinking and focus. Right? There's nothing worse than coming to someone and saying, Kirk, I think I, uh, I think I want this system and they kind of sort of want to do this and then this and this. Oh, but actually, you know, actually here I want to do that and very fuzzy, right? And it's a problem if you don't have it. You need synchronized movements. The team, the technical teams, they talked about how technical people think, particularly your process focus, right? And they're thinking in terms of I need to have some stories. I need to have them estimated so we can have a release plan. We need to put them in iteration sprints if we're doing scrub. And then we're going to plan our work and we're going to do it. It's going to be accepted and all that stuff. That's their flow. Okay? But there's the requirements flow too. Yeah? What is the focus and priority for my business value? 
How do I start with that? How do I go from there to a big picture view so I can communicate what the pieces are and how they fit in? So when I have my conversation with Kirk, I hope you don't mind me picking on you, I'm not fuzzy about it, right? So what happens in the stream of requirements work, you got to get rid of I think it kicked out of the network. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, you might have to come in. Okay, I'll, I'll fix that. Start that. <coughs> I can keep talking while I'm over this and too distracting mm -hmm. people, right? So, you know, this, uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is a problem you have to focus on that aspect of the interaction, right? Uh, and while you're moving, just like in dance or fight choreography, you need to keep your movements in harmony with each other, right? Which means that not only do I need to know, you know I'm stepping in like this, my powerful technique, but I need to make sure that as I do that and I pull on my opponent's sleeve and, and collar, that they are moving up onto their toes, becoming vulnerable to my technique. Uh, uh, is, is it the, you know what I can do here? Is it the, the hotel wireless that keeps keeping me? No, you I don't think so. But what I'll do is turn off my uh, wireless if I can quickly find that. Network, I think it is. Turn it off. Go. So that's an important principle. Move it on. Think, think about ballroom dancing. How could you get away with ballroom dancing if one partner moved? You know, it's a beautiful wall, so one, two, three, one, two, three, right? And one person's going one, two, three, one, and the other going one, two, three, one. You would very quickly fall over, actually, right? So, so you know, I realize that's it, very important, too. And in, in circles of agile software development, that really means people being prepared for the interactions they have to have, so you're not out of sync, okay? And I think those are the primary most important principles that drove the way I worked, and falling out of trying to fit that together, one other principle surfaced, which was that a number of the uh, protocols and practices that we're told to do can become very, very long-winded and exhausting if we try them to do more than <coughs> one shot, okay? So how, how, just out of interest, how many of you have attempted a one-month sprint in your past lives? Not so many, okay. Well, that's good news because it's quite hard to do that, right? The Scrum book says to plan a month-long sprint, you need to have a planning day, right? Do you remember that? You do a two-week sprint, you'd expect it to take about half a day, right? I did month-long sprints at one point. I did a whole day of planning. I'll tell you something. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we were exhausted, and our plan was crap after that, right? So, so I realized you've got to spread the pain of some of these things out of it. Imagine doing a release plan for a project that might be six months long because it's a very significant and serious system. Right? One of my friends would say that's so boring for so long. But you know, not everybody can deploy their system every few weeks. Some people are building things that have to go out in the big block, right? Imagine doing a release plan for how many days might that take you to do? Right? Even if it was two whole days, the afternoon of the second day is not going to be particularly good plan. So I learned the principle of spreading the pain of planning is very important as well, right? So, so I want to show you how I tackled these problems and some of the things I did. And you know, the metaphor of choreography is a really good one, but I'm a terrible dancer, <laughs> as you may have seen. I'm a much better martial artist, right? Uh, but uh, so I can't show you any fancy dance moves, but the thoughts are there, right? So First one, if you wanted to call it anything, you could call it like the dance of the business, right? And, and this is about focus, right? And this is a, a, a thing that involves your business sponsors and your product owner. These are the interactions. It's what is business value, right? And 
What is the business itself, company, organization trying to get? And what does that mean to the staff of that business? Right? And if I can understand what we're trying to do, you know, it's costing us too much in our call center. Right? Or customers are unhappy with us because we aren't responsive on the call center. They're having to wait 10 minutes to talk to somebody. Right? This is a business problem, and you can set a business goal to address that. Okay? So, to understand how our product and our release and our development helps the business get better, we need to link it. So, if that's the problem in our call center, what do our call center staff and users of our call center system have to be able to do? They need to be able to answer the questions from the customer quicker. They need to be able to get put on the phone with the customer quicker, and probably a whole bunch of other things, right? And then we can say, okay, for them to be able to do that, what are some of the things our product could do to help? You know, maybe, maybe we need more intelligent routing of phone calls, so we don't end up with too many calls lining up behind someone who's already on the phone. Maybe we need a better knowledge base, so we are. Once they're on the phone, they get off the phone quicker. Right? Those kinds of things, right? And this is about focus and understanding business value. And to be able to say, you know, um, this story is important because it helps me do something that I need to do to improve the business situation in our organization. Right? And this takes away some of the waffle. In the, in the discussions that you have, right? And um, to a certain extent, it's the big picture view. So an interesting practical strategy for this is a thing I call, you could call it, it's got two names, depending where you're starting, right? If you start from the top, it's a goal decomposition analysis, right? And it's a conversation you have with the business person, right? And you say to them, what is the problem in your organization? This is actually a real one. This is a group that was responsible for tracking filings in a securities exchange, right? It's a very manual process. They receive paper. The paper comes in. It's from a company. They have to look the company up in their system. They have to check what filings were due, and they're gonna mark off that it's been received. And then they save it, that one goes in the outbox for filing somewhere else, and they get to the next one. Right? We sound like a very exciting job. And this particular organization had problems with productivity. They weren't getting enough of these things processed. They were always feeling like they're behind. They didn't really want to staff up more people because they thought they could do better with their systems. So conversation we had went around like this. It's like, okay, so productivity is a problem for you. So what are the things about what your staff are doing and what, how the system helps them that are getting in the way of that? Right? And the first one, I said, well, the system's just so slow. Right? It's so slow. If I open this thing, I have to wait seconds, sometimes half a minute for the screen to be displayed. Right? And that's a problem. Twice a month, we send reminder letters out. Right? Twice a month, we send reminder letters out. And because of the way our system's configured, it draws information from two or three other, I think it was three other source systems. Right? But there are glitches. So sometimes what's in our reminder letter isn't right. So we have to get all the reminder letters we've printed. And then we've got to do an eyeball check to these other systems to make sure the data's right. And if it isn't, we've got to correct it. Right? In a month, that took them one day, two times, right? Roughly, that's your round numbers, 20 working days in a month, two days wasted, 10% productivity hit right there, okay? The other thing they had was you know, a call center set up in their phone system and no way to share work in their system. You know, so the companies that I was responsible for say, I can update. But if Rick here got a phone call, from someone about one of my companies. He couldn't take care of it for me. 
And if I'm on the phone with someone else, they've got to wait. And he's got to wait to hand it to me. So not only is the customer waiting, but we're both blocked, right? So, yeah. So the power of this discussion allowed us to look at our product and link stories to direct business value, right? Uh, a very interesting case study that came out of this, and this is sort of part of a little way the question you asked earlier about, about how do you get the business people to, to, to you know, deal with tools and things like that, right? The solutions to these problems were not more functional requirements. The solutions to these problems were architectural, right? The solution architect in this particular project had been saying, you know, we need to clean out our, our, our layers. There was actually a thing called Capparis in this system that sat between the UI and the database. And it did nothing. They weren't using it for anything. All it did was translate query language from the cat Paris's form of query language into Oracle SQL, right? And then it sent it on. And they've been saying to the, the, the product owner all the time, there, we really ought to do this. The system would be much better with this. And the product owner's going, like, yeah, yeah, I know. We've got to get all this stuff done. So I don't get it. We won't do that. And they had no way to explain how feature of the change. Generated business value. Right? When we went through this exercise, I asked them, okay, how much slower is the screen repaint because of this cap Paris load? And this is about 25% slower than it needs to be. Right now, think back to the work scenario I explained right at the beginning. I've received piece of paper, look it up on the screen, check it off, and I put the piece of paper away. The majority of their work time is spent waiting for the screen. Right? So if I can make that screen display 25% quicker, I can gain easily 20% productivity back from my team when they're in front of their system. Right? And that suddenly became a very compelling argument for the product owner as to why we should do that particular story, right? Where they could no no buy in the form. And that, that's what this dance is about, is the discussion between the product owner and their business to understand what the impacts of these uh, business issues are and how they're affected by your system so you can better prioritize your backlog, right? With the ad added anecdote, which I found quite enlightening that it also gives you a reason to justify what otherwise would be considered, you know, that's those geek guys, they just want to do something cool with the technology, right? Same thing with the data integrity. You know, we've got to fix these pipes and interfaces to the back-end systems. You know, yeah, I know, but I need this report, right? Well, we fix those things, it's another 10% gain, right? One thing to be careful of, so this manager is not a very technically savvy person. I asked her, I asked her so what, uh, what do you think would be a realistic target for our productivity improvement here? Right? So how many of you have actually asked those kinds of questions or worked in, in organizations where you've had a productivity improvement initiative? Any, any point of view? And, and a normal number that's considered good in business process improvement is things like, 5% or even 3% in a large organization, right? She said 50%. I was like, oh, I wish I hadn't asked that question. And then when we did this, I was really glad I did because I could come back there and say, if we do these two things, we can get you at least 30% gain back, I think. Something like that. How would that do for you? And she goes, oh, that would be really good. I said, I think we could do that by the summer. Right? There's no way we can get these 75 stories done by summer. She was frantic about that. I said, but you know, all your game can be done with these few things. And that actually was really powerful to support release planning as well. Right? So, so this, this is a really important um, conversation that needs to be had. And if you just say, let's go and talk to the business, 
get nowhere. But if you go to the business with some structure for your conversation, it's a much, much better dialogue, right? And uh, you know, the thing, the thing I took away from this particular case was not that, all right, so we need structure. Because you know, engineers, that often leads to methodologies, right? And we need some loose structure, some principles and focus. But we don't need prescriptive step by steps. Okay, go and ask them this question, then ask them this question, then ask them this question. But without that little bit of structure, we can easily be lost. Right? Uh, okay, this one. So if you write your user stories like this, usually it says, this is the my phone one, as a, as a role, I want to do something so I get something of value. Get some value. That's what it uses. I think that's what it uses. If you instead write it this way, so I can achieve a goal, now you can use that same idea from the bottom up, and then you call it goal tracing. All right? So goal tracing is like the Kevin Bacon game from years ago. All right? You know, who do you know? How many steps is it before I can say that person knows Kevin Bacon? All right? Some of you know that game. This is. Well, if I do this thing, this helps me do this, right? If I replace Captaris, it repaints the screen 25% quicker. Okay, that's good. What does that mean? That means I can process a filing 25% quicker, right? That means my whole team is more productive to some scaled amount, probably 20%, right? That's goal tracing, right? And now, do I need to justify the importance of that story? Yes, because we've got to put it in an order in our backlog. And I have a direct way to compare that with data integrity. Right? And the power to me of this is it allows you to get away from some of the arguments that people say, like, you've got to be able to quantify everything in dollars. It's very hard to do some of these things in dollars. These ones wouldn't be quite so hard. But not everything is easily there. right? And Unlike some of the authors, as they suggest, we can't always have accountants assigned to our project team to calculate value for us, right? So, so this was a really important starting point, right? Um, next one, six. So, so then there's a couple of other you know, dances, interactions, if you like, to do with how the product owner interacts with the team, right? And the first one is kind of the, the dance of the big picture. Right? This is about, uh, I've got my cards for it right here. Uh, oh, I can do it on the slides anyway. Um, this is about being able to get your team to understand overall what you're trying to do, to understand the context of what the requirements are, and to get you quickly to a point where you can have a release plan so you can determine the feasibility of whether or not this solution is billable in the time frames the constraints that you have on it, right? So this is, this is a discussion about you know, what are all the stories, the big epics, and what are the pieces of those, and what is this one about, and roughly how big might that be, and you know, how would you work out what our velocity is, and, so and you need a conversation about it. But you need a different kind of conversation than you would have for sprint planning, right? Because if you have the conversation that you'd have about sprint planning, you know, what is the story? What are your acceptance criteria? What exactly do they need? You know, what, what might be the way we would build this system? It's not going to take you a few days. It's going to take you a few weeks. And you need to know not to have that conversation early to save that one for a sprint by sprint discussion. Okay. So this is part of the principle of synchronizing movements. Right? <coughs> if our movements are synchronized, what I need to have is that the product owner comes to this interaction prepared for the big picture discussion, no waffling, right? The team comes to the discussion understanding that we're working at a high level here. This is not something that's a firm commitment. So it's okay for us to estimate based on loose requirements because we have an opportunity later to do a more refined commitment points estimate on our, on our backlog. Okay? And so it's the, it's the dance around the breadth of the product backlog. It's the dance around what is our likely solution architecture, big building blocks, to the extent that you know, 
the technology you choose impacts the estimates. Right? If it comes to a point where we could use framework A or framework B for the user interface, but it doesn't matter which one, who cares? Right? As long as you know it's one of those two, and not this third one that's going to make your UI development twice as, uh, uh, twice as uh, much effort. Right? And the output of it is your classic release plan. You know, we've scoped how many points we can get from the release. We've decided which storage we think will be in. We probably have mapped some of the high priority storage to the early uh, sprints. And we do that to the point that it makes sense. And the rest, if you like, are in a huge sprint that's the rest of the project. Okay. Something, something I've, I've really taken to love in the last two, three years is the story map. Who's heard of a story map? Yeah? If you haven't, look for story mapping. Look for Jeff Patton. Jeff with the J, he's the inventor of this. These are really cool, right? And really quick. The idea is to communicate how stories fit into the big picture easily so everyone can understand. So it goes like this. You lay out the big picture breadth of your system with a series of ethics. That's the blue thing. Okay, from a product owner perspective, you then start doing some business analysis. You're de decomposing your effects into smaller pieces, and you keep going and, uh, and going until you think you've got everything there. So now when we come to this dance with the, the big picture dance with the um, product team, and we want to talk about this story here, right? If, in fact, the holy grail of this is this is on the wall in the team room. So you can say, we're talking about this uh, add a scheduled uh, payment transaction record to our system. And they can see that that is part of scheduling. And it's something that comes after this and is a variant of this one. So they can place it in their mind. They've got context and they can get better understanding of the requirement and therefore make better um, estimates of it without having to have a detailed spec, without having to have a detailed you know, design of this story. It's a great enabler for fast, um, you know, fast estimating of things at a high level. Right? And, and it's got applications in various different ways in, in the context of this discussion that you can also create layers through it, like a layer page, to support your release plan. Right? So this is saying, these are the most important stories across my whole system, right? And then this layer is the next set, and this layer is the next set, which is really powerful because it means you can prioritize everything, whereas if you didn't have this kind of depiction, yeah, and they're all in a list, how do you know which ethics are more important than each other? Well, the answer is none of them are, because parts of them are, the parts of them aren't, right? So you can have these done in big layers, so there's a lot of these, and that's like a release. Or you can have them in smaller layers if you feel like it. This might be more like a sprint uh, down here. It really depends how big your, your project is. Right? So the product of comes to this conversation prepared to explain their backlog, and they can leverage tools like this. They can leverage tools like the goal tracing technique to explain the context of their stories. And the development team is able to go away understanding where it fits in. They can make better solution architecture decisions and better planning decisions with you. Okay. Right. So from there, you move on to the dance of the small picture. Right? And, and again, you know, synchronized movements. Right? What the product owner has to do to come into here is to take their backlog in order of priority, as we're told, right? And add detail in the form of acceptance criteria, right? And be prepared to have a conversation with the development team about explicitly what those things are. That's kind of what we get told, right? That's, that's not as much as here to here all the way, but it's like quite a big step and another big step, right? We need a little bit of choreography to get all the way through without <laughs> right? So, what, what are the steps? Well, the product owner has to have story details. 
the need to have acceptance from the team. The team needs to understand them, so we have to talk about them, right? And in talking about them, we may change the details. In fact, when I do this with my teams, often what happens is the product owner comes in with you know, three or five acceptance criteria on a story. And when they leave, they leave with a much better story, which may have as many as eight or ten bullet points on it now. Right? Which sounds like a lot, except what it's done is it's made it very clear how we're going to test the story. The story is now ready to be implemented. Right? Uh, and the key activities to me, we, we talk about backlog grooming in Agile without being very clear about what it is. Right? And then there's sprint planning as well. Right? And this interaction is all about how we take the story detail, use a backlog grooming discussion to refine acceptance criteria, be clear how we would test them, discuss in the team how we think we'll implement it, validate our estimates. So if it was five points from release planning, is it still five points now that we know more about it? And if it is, okay, and if it isn't, what should it be? You know, you know, actually, this is easier than we thought, it's three. Or no, we've actually got to do this as well that we haven't thought of, it's eight or 13. We hope it's not 20, right? That would be better, or more, right? And so we are ready the sprint plan. So this is a really useful thing I can do, right? I, I found it took away a lot of frustration from uh, a number of teams I work with. You'd have people show up at these grooming meetings, or worse, actually I'll tell you a story before I just generally, right? Uh, a project I worked with about four years ago, they had two sprints from release, right? They're doing three-week sprints, six weeks to go, right? Product owner comes in the room, it's sprint planning. We've done three stories. Everything's going good. We're halfway through the morning, we're planning to be done at lunchtime. You know, it's, it's sort of about quarter to 11. And okay, now this other story, this, this one, we've really got to get this one in because if I don't get this story in, we're, I'm going to get killed by all my managers. It's okay, what is it? It's advanced search. Great. Pulled it open. I, I just sort of face drop. As a user, I want to search for anything that I want using any criteria so I can find anything I'm, look, I'm looking for. It's like, I'm like, what? And the team, you know, I actually was supposed to just be auditing and giving feedback at this time. And the team, they're like, oh, that is, you know, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, maybe it's the other. And the whole technical team started brainstorming what it might be. Poor product owner, and he sat there, you know, no one asked me, well, what exactly do you need? Uh, and after about 20 minutes, they started asking her things, and it was like, gosh, you know, we can't do this in a sprint. I don't think we can even do it in two sprints. You know, we don't even know what it is. And they're going on and on. And we had to stop sprint planning, right, so that the product owner could go away with some of the team and they could work out explicitly what would be an acceptable advanced search. And it came back to, well, you know, advanced search really is set of fields that we need to search on, there was about eight, and how and, and, and deciding how you would connect those together. You know, is it ands and ors or contains or begins type things, you know, things that you write SQL, you know, querying language stuff, all those kinds of discussions become important in determining what the result set is, right? And this was a pivotal moment in my coaching career, because coming out of this is what this came. Right? It's like, we can't be going to sprint planning with stories that are not ready for implementation. Because otherwise, what happens is you stop the development team. Right? So if there's one thing you take away from today, if you're a product owner here, I won't ask your hands up if you are, uh, is never go to sprint planning with a story that's not ready. Because I'll tell you what you will have done. You will have blocked your sprint team for as long as it takes you to finish. You should never have a story that's not ready because it's up to the team which stories they do in what order. That's self-organization, right? And if they can't take any of those stories and start on it as soon as they leave sprint planning, you just compromise their ability to commit to the sprint, right? 
So we did it this way for this one, and it's, it's like definition of done. In fact, it's the reflection of the definition of done, right? So the idea is that the team kind of has to socialize with the product owner and agree what it is, right? This was our agreement. We wanted a story small enough. We were on three-week sprints. We didn't want them all dropping in week three, right? We wanted at least to see one story in week one and you know, a few in week two, and then the rest near the beginning of week three, right? We had dependency on a fair amount of manual testing. We couldn't just push a button at the end of the week and say, yep, everything's good. We're not good. So, so there was a sizing component. It had to be prioritized, that's kind of obvious, because if it's not prioritized, you don't know what's important. Uh, we needed to know the description and acceptance criteria were clearly stated, and that they were testable. And if there were any extra supporting detail that was necessary, that it was available. Not in this project, but in a different one I worked with, they had a thing where they were recording uh, payments for services. And this was a government agency, and they had to assign a fee code to a payment. And they had 120 different fee codes, right? Well, there's no way you would write a list of 120 different fee codes as an acceptance criteria against a user store. So what we did was we'd say, uh, there's an attached document, we were using uh, uh, Rally for this, right? So we linked to a document that listed the details, and our acceptance criteria were that you can select one of the defined fee codes and assign it to the payment transaction. Right? And this is a way to make sure the team uh, has access to information that it needs without getting him in the habit of the idea that you know, the story replaces the spec. Right? A little caveat for you, the scrum, you know, scrum masters that are here, I know some of you are here from my session yesterday, uh, you have to keep an eye that the team isn't always asking for details. Right? They should only ask for details and only be provided details that are needed. So for example, if as a product owner you don't care what the screen looks like, you don't need to give them a wireframe. Right? They should just go with the best solution they, they, they have. Right? Uh, warning signs, another real story. Uh, we had one like this where we had a story that there's a customer setup screen. And on the customer setup screen, we need to enter a set of data. There was about 15 fields. So we gave them a story that said we're on a customer setup screen that has these fields in it. You know, these ones are mandatory, these ones are optional, right? These ones are validated, these ones are not. And that's what I want. And the developer says to us at one point, he says, uh, well, you know, I can't really do this because I don't have the screenshots, so I suppose I'll have to make something up. And he says this in front of a customer, right? <laughs> I wanted to bump him. It's like, I was, you know, he was, there was nothing he said that was wrong, okay? But the interaction was so negative, right? And, and you know, that links back to what Steve was saying about the soft skills, right? You know, we need to be able to coach our developer, so this is slightly divergent from talking about the, the, the requirements movement here, but it's sort of part of the puzzle, the puzzle here. Whereas technical people, we need to be able to express our sentiments in a way that are positive. Yeah? What he probably should have said was, okay, I see we don't have a, a mock-up or wireframe of this screen, so you know, I guess I'll, I'll make my own design, will that be okay? And you find out whether it's important or not, right? And, and words are so important in, the, in these interactions. It's all, they're almost like the, 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 the micro steps of the dance, right? Because if you don't use the right words, you end up you know, falling over somehow, right? So, so we had that. Um, we wanted to make sure it's all reviewed and understood by the team and, and estimated or re-estimated. So you know, what these, the, uh, most of these things mean is that you know, these are the conversations we have to have in our backlog grouping sessions, right? And if you uh, don't do it that way, right, then you have to have these conversations during sprint planning, right? And if you find out that some of that isn't right in sprint planning, you block the team, right? Your movements are not synchronized. Your movements are not synchronized. In fact, the other principle I like to talk about in here is 
not only are the movements not synchronized, they're not in harmony, right? Because although the steps may be there, the steps are not flowing, right? So this sort of brings me to kind of a closing. Uh, so it leads, leads to the last sort of principle here of spreading the pain. Slow on a bit, right? So I wasn't sure how to show this visually, so I made this up in Outlook. So a lot of, a lot of guidance around release planning is had, you know, release planning workshop, you know, spend a couple of days, get everybody together all at once, okay? And as I said earlier, you know, it, it can be very exhausting. But there are other impacts too, if we go another way. I often do it this way where I'll spread it out, and, and the first few activities are all about reviewing the backlog, estimating the stories, high-level points estimates, and then finishing up with release planning, right? Now, whether it turns two days into three and a half days, or it's even three days, it's really not, that doesn't matter. But what I'm doing here is I'm allowing the team time to freshen their brains, right? You don't suddenly get, you don't hit a point where you are or you know, suddenly overwhelmed, you know, I used all my cards, and you know, it's like, gosh, I don't know which one I'm looking at anymore, I don't know which one I'm thinking about anymore, right? Uh, so there's a time to refresh yourself and come back and, and do a better job. But there, there's a couple of other things that are important here too. In that definition of ready, we said correct information was available, acceptance criteria are testable, uh, all those good things, right? Well. Scrum tells us, XP tells us, you know, a lot of the best methodologies tell us, you know, get someone who knows the requirements. Great! But how do I know whether I should be jumping here or here? Right? If I know, great. If I don't know, and I'm in a two, three day long release planning workshop, I'm stuck. Right? Whereas if you spread it out a bit, spread the pain, a, the jump doesn't hurt. But I actually have a slight Achilles injury still, right? That's what hurt. But I have a little bit of decompression time where the product owner can go and have some conversations with the business, go back to the, 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 the dance of the business and clarify some needs, right? Or the technical team has time to go and have their own technical dance around solution architecture and design. You know, how would we build this thing? Right? and uh, come back out. So when you come to try and schedule these things in release planning, you can just focus on the release plan. Okay? Now, clearly, if your team hasn't got anything else to do, this may not work so well, because, okay, what are they gonna do in between times, right? But oftentimes, especially if it's a new team, you're in that sprint zero situation, right? You need to get a release plan for sure, but you probably have some solution architecture to do. You may have a development environment to set up. You probably will have a team environment to set up, right? So if you integrate this into a sprint zero, you know, a kickoff sprint, then there's no reason not to spread it out, spread the pain, make it easy, right? Okay. And the same principle is true of sprint plan, right? You know, if you, every two weeks you go from, <laughs> I don't know why that, oh, time zone problem, right? Uh, if you go all morning or all day building a sprint plan, right, you can have the same issue. Right? If you spread it out a bit, have a backlog grooming discussion. The focus is get the stories to ready. Right? And when, so when you come to sprint planning, we know the estimates are good. Know, there's only any last minute adjustments to be done, not all of it. We've already thought through a bit about the design. If we need to spend some time and think further between grooming and planning, because we've seen the stories now, we've got a window of opportunity to put a bit more considered thought into our design. And spread planning goes much quicker then. Right? Your commitment of your team, this is the critical thing in spread planning. You want a team to be committed to deliver, right? And uh, if they had sufficient time to think about the design problem and the work, planning the work, the technical work problem, then their sprint plan would be much more solid, right? If you do it all in one go, 
there may be things they can't work out and they have to guess. Right? Bad to guess design. It's bad to guess estimates of tasks. It's definitely bad to guess on what the requirements are of the product that is not ready. So you have, you have many opportunities here. And then the other thing, the other thing this does is an ancillary thing. Um, what did you call it? Beating the drum, right? Well, you think of it as a heartbeat, right? You know, the drum beat is boom, 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 boom. We've got a rhythm. This is another of those things, by the way, you hear the, the, the speakers will often talk about, well, you have to have a cadence to your agile process. You know, there has to be a rhythm and a heartbeat. And they talk about this without saying what it is, right? This is a concrete example of what it is. There's a heartbeat here that says every Tuesday in the morning, we're going to the product owner to talk about requirements that we're going to implement soon. Everyone gets used to that. So every Tuesday morning, they come in mentally prepared for that conversation. Right? Every other Tuesday, we're talking about requirements so we can plan their implementation in the sprint. And in the in-between Tuesdays, we're talking about these requirements to make sure we understand what they are so we're ready to have the planning conversation. Right? It's a habit forming uh, our heartbeat. Right? Just like the concept of the sprint is. Right? You, know, you get used to the idea that every two weeks or every three weeks or every four weeks you have a version of your software that's working enough that you can show someone how they might use it. Right? Same kind of thing. Brings the, the principle further on. Okay? That's a human Okay, so yeah, you can do that. Thank you, Susan. Take a seat. So so what what is what what have I said? I've got a conclusion. Here we go. So to me, why it's choreography is if you understand those small steps that get you in position to do the big leaps, everything is going to run smoothly, right? If you want to throw someone to the ground like this, never going to work, right? If you know you're going to throw them to the ground by moving so smoothly, it flows. Right? So this means not prescriptive methodolog methodological structure, but some loose structure just to give us a rough idea what the steps are. All right? In judo, that particular technique, you can do it if your opponent comes towards you. You still take some small steps, slightly different steps, turn away and throw them down. If they're moving away from you in the right way, you can lunge in, stop them, and throw them down. If they come around you, move slightly differently and throw them down, right? Still steps, different context, different, similar result, right? But if we were too prescriptive about it, that yes, well, you're going to go here, you're going to go here, and here, and here. Fine, <coughs> if they're standing still. <coughs> and as soon as they move, one way or the other, won't work. Right? And this is what I think our agility should be striving for, is to give us enough structure to have the right conversations and interact about the right things, but keeping our agility there so we can get the result right, successfully. Right? So the way I did it was to focus as much on putting the right people together in the right forum for the right conversation, and then letting them go. Right? You know, it's like we know we're here to talk about the big picture of the requirements. It's the team with the product owner, and the end point of this is a rough high-level sketch of what it's going to be in our project. Right? And, and then they can have their conversation. Right? They all know not to talk about requirements in detail. The product owner knows not to put the team on the spot and say, yeah, I'd ask us. Now, you're definitely going to do this by July, right? Because that's not the conversation we're having at this time. Right? Go to sprint planning. 
different conversation. I know what it is. I know how to build it. And I said, we'll definitely do these three things, three things for you by a week on Friday. Different conversation. Okay. Uh, as scrum masters, one of the easiest things you can do is just find the space, make sure you can have the right visuals in it. And if you're in one of these organizations where meeting rooms have to be booked, some of you will have those, book them. Book them months ahead because you know you're going to go there because of the heartbeat, right? And if you do that, no one else gets your meeting room and moves you around either. Right? So, so that's, that's you know, a key thing really to, to unlocking this. So, so what, what are the key elements? It's goal-driven planning, story mapping or something like it to communicate the big picture of your backlog and where the stories fit in context. Having things like definitions of ready to make sure that the team doesn't get blocked by uh, incomplete requirements. And what happens is that the, the uh, energy level of the team flows. No one gets sort of exhausted in bursts. You know, you don't have scenarios where, gosh, sprint planning was so tiring yesterday and you know, it takes everybody till lunchtime the next day to get started. Right? You avoid that. People make less mistakes, right? When you're tired, you make mistakes. So let's not be tired. And then things will go better, right? You know, there's, there's a downward sort of flywheel effect, right? I get tired, I make mistakes. Okay, I get stressed. I work harder, which makes me tired, so I make mistakes, and it gets worse and worse and worse, right? And we want to spin that flywheel up the other way, right? Um, these heartbeat strategies gives us time to clarify our understanding, deal with unknowns in enough time that we can that we can move forward. And ultimately the whole flow is much smoother. It's elegant. Right? It's elegant. So that's what I want to share for today. To think about how do we organize the steps? How do we make sure people are focused on the right things, get the right people together? to have structured conversations about the right thing to generate more success in your agile process. All right, so questions, thoughts? Yes. I have one question. We've been dealing with some really complicated requirements, as I'm sure a lot of people do. And so we have the backlog refinement meeting, and we get to talk about a lot of things usually comes at the expense of having some things not get written down as much. Mm -hmm. So then we have, in between backlog and sprint planning, we'll have, you know, some people go aside and work on getting things written down. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's hard to find that balance. Do you have any, you know, insights into you finding that balance of... Like, how much to write down, is that the question? Conversation versus yeah. how much to write down. Yeah. And how to I have a soundbite, <laughs> which is where I'll start, right? <laughs> which is... Uh, Documentation should be a record of a conversation, not a replacement for it. Okay, so that's the sound bite. What, what does that really mean practically? What it means is that, that uh, uh, and it sounds like your, your approach is in the right direction, then. You, you have to discuss the problem because it's much, much quicker to get understanding there, right? And, and then what I encourage people to document are the important things that you don't want to forget. Okay, so uh, if the important thing, say for the sake of argument, was there's a particular sequence of checks we have to perform as a business transaction flows from you know, one component of our system to another to another, you need to write those down somewhere. Um, but, you know, it's note form. If we've already all had the conversation, the notes need to be enough to remind us of the key points, right? So, you know, for example, if we use that as an example, right, then um, as, a, as a sort of a test case, you would go away and do a pretty UML activity diagram to describe the flow, and then annotate it with detailed, you know, field by field descriptions of, you know, field length and field type and all those kinds of things to describe the, the data flow. Uh, if those things are reasonably well understood, or if those things weren't particularly important, 
because what's important is the change of state of the transaction as it navigates through your system, right? So you just record the pertinent piece, right? Uh, the, 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 the thing that you have to watch for is, in theory, and some of our esteemed XP people will tell you, you just need to talk to the customer about this because they know, right? That's a great theory. But when it's that complicated, your customer might know, but they may not be able to get it out, right? You know, I, I was saying at the beginning, this guy is waffling all over the place. Well, I, this actually happened. It was like, we need to select an originator ID. This is a, an ID in a system that allows someone to set up payroll transaction jobs, right? And he said, yeah, we've got to do this. We've got to pick one which constrains the scope in which we, we uh, are, are can perform actions on a particular account, okay? And he said, uh, yeah, he, and we started talking about it in administration, this administration module, right? And he starts talking this, oh, actually, no, no, we, we actually need to use it over here, and he picked his stick out and he walked in an entirely different part of the system, right? And, and you know, it's a small example, but it's one where this belongs here and here, okay? And although he knew it, he hadn't captured it, so when he communicated with the team, it generated confusion. I chat with him afterwards about that one, right? And then we uh, convened some backlog development workshops with that group to say, look, you've got to know what it is when you're talking to the technical team. So that would be an example, right? Now, I mean, your case may not be that simple, it's, it's a, it's a cost-benefit thing. You know, the more documentation you write, the more upkeep you've got to maintain it, but what we really want is to have it in the system, right? Uh, I don't subscribe to the point of view that the code is the entire documentation of your system, uh, but nor do I subscribe to the idea that every story needs to have a functional spec associated with it. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. When we're talking about the choreography between uh, somebody saying they have a goal or there's a requirement to uh, something being ready to build, mm -hmm. there's a very big black box which um, where product innovation, design, uh, brainstorming on solutions comes into. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how does that how. How, where it fits into the, the process, right. the idea that the business owner said that they want this, but we had a bunch of smart people who realized what they said isn't necessarily what they need. Mm -hmm. uh, we designed a solution that is innovative, as right. opposed to just, you know, I wanted 50 check boxes. See, this is the conundrum of the product owner, right? Scrum tells us the product owner is the person who knows what the business needs. Uh, what the priorities are, can make budget, schedule, feature set, trade-off decisions, and they have a vision of what the product would be and how it helps their business, right? And there's only ever been one Clark Kent in fiction, right? <laughs> so you're, you're out of luck, generally, right? Unless you work for a high-tech company where business people are also technologists, right? Now, it's no surprise that a lot of these initiatives community started developer-centric in high-tech companies because it's much easier, right? So um, the, the, there is a link, right, that, that analysis. That's where on that slide I put business user product and then release, right? So really for that is the business user product. And how you get from user to product is your innovation and envisioning your solution, okay? Uh, I didn't put it up in here, but a thing I do with teams sometimes is a visioning workshop. There's a structured way to go through what the business problem is or opportunity. Sometimes you don't have a problem. It's, well, we could get into this market, right? Um, and how that translates into what staff need, and then you have to think, of, well, how would a system help us, right? So this discussion, by the time you're going from uh, uh, user goals to product goals, is one where you need technical people involved as well, right? And, and companies that have good 
architect or whatever flavor you want to call them. You know, I tend to use the word solution architect because it's a little more general and you don't have to worry about, well, is he a software architect or is she an application architect or whatever <coughs> kind of architect they are. You know, you're focusing practically on what we're going to build, right? And these are the kind of people you need in that conversation to, to help suggest, well, you, did you know that you can do this with this technology? Or did you know that you know, we can do that on mobile now? And that would actually solve the problem more easily than you're thinking, right? Um, so I don't think I'm answering your question, really. But, but there is, there is a, a yeah, it's almost like there's another dance, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the way that um, Scrum is set up today, mm -hmm. basically it, it evolved from this concept of a story and XP. Mm -hmm. And XP, of course, was for very small projects. Yeah. And, and basically, go ask the customer. Mm -hmm. And the product owner is the liaison between the customer and the team. One of the things that Scaled Agile is now doing very well for, and this is a scaling problem, I think you're in a larger organization. So what Dean Lesterman does quite well, he says, okay, well, architectural stories are a first class citizen. They're not expected to come from the product owner who may have expertise at the product level, at the application level, uh, layer level, but from the actual architects that you're speaking mm -hmm. of, that really understand business and the technology to develop an architectural runway in advance of the stories that get layered on top of that architecture. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the answer is, right. is, is that there's, yeah. there's two sources for stories. Mm -hmm. One is the architectural stories, sometimes called tech stories, and the other is the actual um, product stories. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting terminology because we often use the word story a shorthand, but a, you, you have user story, very user focused, and you can have technical or architectural stories that are more infrastructure focused. Right? Um, it wasn't last year, was it a couple of years ago, Philippe? Maybe three. Right. Where are you giving me the hook? <laughs> yeah, basically. This is the last, this is the last, <laughs> uh, last comment. Philippe Christian, who's a good friend of mine. Uh, and, 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 and Steve's and probably some, some others of you, he did a talk here called What Color Is My Backlog? Right? Yeah, it was and, three years ago. Yeah, I know it was a few years ago. It really yeah. sticks in your head because you know there are functional user-focused stories and they might be green stories and they could have yellow stories or your architecture stories and you can have red stories that are technical debt stories, right? But the backlog has to represent all the work that your, your project team is going to do. So all of that has to be in your backlog. But then, of course, if you have those technical user stories, you get into Yagni territory. It's yeah. easy to build castles in the air. Yagni, oh, anybody who doesn't know, it means you ain't gonna need it. Mm -hmm. It's the overbuilding. Yeah. So there yeah. is that. Yeah. You have to watch out for that. Yes. Now, here's, here's why, why I'm so glad you brought it up, right? Is, is there's a little hook to the, the conversation you have to have, right? And this is a, a, a learning from the technical people when you have these more technical backlog items, they still need to be prioritized, right? And the product owner, the business, prioritizes all the backlog. That's what I say, right? And so it means that if you've got an architectural problem, you need to explain it, maybe with the help of the product owner, but you need to be able to explain the value in terms that they can prioritize. Right? Yeah. We need to redo the database schema and, and the table structure because we need to do it. Okay? That's not going to get anyone on the business side very excited. Right? We need to do it because it's ugly and it's difficult for us to work in. So, you're smart. You can work in this, right? Because I need this new feature, right? We need to redo the schema and the table structure because query response time is slow. And this new feature you want cannot be implemented uh, with those relationships because you're going to have uh, our relationship links that mean you get orphaned, orphaned sub records or things like that, right? Now I've got an argument. Yes, Robert? I would then argue that uh, the query you mentioned is the only story 
Uh, there's yep. a distinction between uh, a user story and then there are tasks to make it happen. Uh, one would be to redesign whatever a schema is or something. Possibly, yeah. That would be a way to handle it. Anyway, I think I'm hooked. You are. Is it lunch? Is that what it is? Or nope. No. 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 No, this is now uh, Robert's territory. Oh, okay. Ah, <laughs> so you kept putting your hand up. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> okay, so we take uh, five or six minutes five while Robert gets his computer set up. Ready. Thank you all.